Here on Long Island, New York area, is a snow blizzard, everyone's home. In honor of this occasion, we're going to bring you this special Lunch and Learn webcast focused on the subject, how to put magic into a fading marriage. The reason for this subject, welcome, this is Rabbi Pearl. The Torah portion this week speaks of how the Jewish people crossed over the Red Sea. And the Talmud will discuss with us something fascinating of the connection between marriage and crossing over the Red Sea. An important focus of our program today, I will be showing you PowerPoint presentations to add to the depth of our subject. Please stay with us. With God's help, we marry our spouse and we live with the belief that we are with our intended soulmate. Though at times it may not seem that the spouse is the lovely soul that we saw in heaven years before, as we'll explain, our focus today that it is our job to look beneath that facade and recognize the beautiful core in our spouse. The topic of our discussion is the splitting of the sea, the Red Sea, where the Talmud comments that matchmaking, finding one's spouse, is as difficult as it was in crossing and splitting of the Red Sea. Why should that be? What's the comparison? We're going to deal with the fact that the Talmud quantifies this statement that, diff that marriage is as difficult as crossing of the Red Sea, to make a marriage, to make a, a shidduch, deals with the second match only. Was in the case where the second marriage, that second marriage has its difficulties. But there are a number of other commentators, and for various reasons, understand the Talmud statement in a more broader sense, and applies it to the entire institute of marriage. Not a first and a second marriage, but really within, the within a marriage, there is two sides. There's a first marriage and a second marriage, as we will explain. Bearing in mind that our fo focus today is to help us appreciate how to bring back the spice, the spirit, the passion into what sadly may be a fading marriage. And we will learn from the analogy of the Talmud comparing making a match is as difficult as crossing the sea will give us insight in how to bring enthusiasm and depth into our marriage. So what we're going to begin by also adding to our understanding in Medrash that the sea, the crossing, the splitting of the Red Sea only happened when the sea saw the Jewish people, led by Moshe, carrying the casket of Joseph. Can you imagine? The Red Sea only agreed to split when it saw Moshe carrying the bones of Joseph in the casket. What's the connection? Why did the sea have to see that and only agree to split after seeing Joseph, Joseph in the, in the casket? Another question we must ask is one second. Why did the sea have to see anything? We know clearly God had made a condition with the Red Sea all the way from creation. There'll come a time you're going to have to split for the Jewish people. So why is it it reneged on this agreement and only agreed to split when it saw Joseph's casket? Please bear with us. It is a fascinating insight. What we're going to find out is that the sea was shown many years ago, the lofty souls of those individuals up in heaven and agreed to split for them years later. The problem was, as we'll soon share with you, that the Jews who actually showed up at the sea were actually lowly idolatrous. 
So when the sea saw these individuals, it claimed that the deal was off. These are not the souls that I saw in heaven. But then, surprisingly, when it saw the casket of Joseph and recalled how he had battled with Potiphar's wife and won, it understood something very important. That though some things externally look not so holy, at their core they're very beautiful. And we're going to continue to explore a Hasidic explanation of the difference between Joseph and his brothers. And we'll arrive at this conclusion. And the clue conclusion is that in our life as well, we must look past the daily challenges that may present themselves with our spouses and remember the beautiful core that we once recognized so easily. And to help us, we're going to use our PowerPoint today in our presentation. And I thank you in advance for joining us today on a rather snowy part of the season and giving us the opportunity to come together through this webcast. Again, when the magic fades, how to put magic back into a fading marriage. Let's begin as by our PowerPoint splitting of the Red Sea, the Reed Sea. Here we find the greatest miracle. And we would say to ourselves, what relationship do we have learning about how the Jewish people cross, crossed over, a miracle happened, they crossed over the Reed Sea. It happened so many years ago. What connection could it have to us today? There are many, many insights. Today we're going to focus on its lesson and insight in how to bring a true appreciation of each other, husband and wife, in marriage. Because the Talmud goes on to tell us that today, making a marriage, to make a marriage, is as difficult as splitting of the Reed Sea. The Talmud connects marriage, matchmaking, to the difficulty of what it means for the sea that runs and flows to suddenly stand still, break its nature, and create those walkways for the Jewish people to cross over. And our discussion is, what's the connection between the two? What would be the connection? And how does it help us today? The Talmud tells us, the Talmud elaborates and explains explains its statement that matchmaking is as difficult as the Red Sea and says we're talking about the second, a second marriage. That the first marriage is pre in prede predestined up in heaven. But when it comes to a second one, in a situation where a person has divorced and now has to go for a second wife, a second spouse, there it's more difficult. And that's how the Talmud basically connects the two. The difficulty of matchmaking refers to the second, a second marriage. But the truth is, other commentators go, go on to explain that really the first marriage and the second marriage are not really on this world. Great commentators explain, Akedis Yitzchak, that really, within everyone's marriage, first marriage, so to speak, really are two sides. When we're getting married now in this world, it's a second marriage. The first marriage was made up in heaven, as we say. God, 40 days before a person is born, God decides who's going to marry whom. That's, so the marriage was made in heaven. And the second marriage, so to speak, is a term used to in the physical sense as our PowerPoint indicates. There's the mystical side, number one. The mystical side takes care upstairs in heaven. And the second side is the actual marriage itself. And we all know to find that to make a match can have its difficulties. That's how one commentator is. A second commentator explains, there's actually first and second very much dependent on our, our actions. That the first marriage is the one 
predestined on high from each for each person. Right? God makes that first marriage, that first match up in heaven. If the person merits it, they're going to land with their soulmate. He or she will indeed land their soulmate. Where comes the difficulty? If he or she hasn't, does not have the individual merits, they will wind up with someone else. That's called the second marriage. This is how the commentaries explain this Talmudical uh, uh, teaching. That matchmaking is as difficult as crossing over the Red Sea and goes on to explain the second marriage. It could be on the simplest understanding when there is a second marriage or to appreciate that every marriage is a second marriage. There's a marriage made in heaven. God decides who are to be married. We marry our spouse. The second marriage represents our efforts on this world to find that individual. Sometimes it's easy. When we are merited, it comes easier. And if not, we don't merit. Either finding that, that soulmate is difficult, or we may end up with someone else because we didn't merit it. Our focus today is that really the, um, the question is, why does the Talmud actually use the analogy of splitting of the sea to describe the difficulty of matchmaking? however the commentators wish to express it. At the end of the day, it is difficult to find a spouse and to make sure that it is the one made in heaven. But why compare it to the splitting of the Red Sea? Is this an appropriate comparison between a marriage and what happened so many years ago? What could be the connection? Why would the Talmud express it that way? So continuing on, King David expresses in the, in the book of his, his Psalms, he describes the splitting of the sea and says the famous words, Hayom Rav Ayonos, which translates, as it sees on our PowerPoint, the sea saw and fled. That the sea fled means it split when? when it saw the casket of Yosef. Just to remind us, Joseph, before he passed away, Joseph, the viceroy in Egypt, made the Jewish people promise that when they would leave, they would carry back his bones in the casket back to where he should be buried in the land of Canaan. Only when the sea saw this, it split and created the, the pathways for the Jewish people to cross. question is, What's the connection here? The sea sees this casket of Yosef and then splits? What could be the reason for this? We have to appreciate that there's something bigger going on. As our PowerPoint says like this. All the way in the beginning of creation, God had made a condition with the sea. Yes, sea is supposed to run and continuously stay fluid. But it's going to come a time in history you're going to have to split and create the splitting of the Red Sea, the Kriyas Yamsuf. So the question we have to ask ourselves, if that was the case, why was it that the Red Sea, the sea did not readily follow through with its condition? It already made a promise and the agreement would split. And here we're learning that the only reason why it split is because it saw the casket with the bones of Joseph. Hello, what's the connection? You have a deal. You made a deal with God. We'll understand this after first appreciating who Yosef was. Why the need for Yosef's casket to split, to make the sea follow through in it with its promise? What's the connection with Yosef? Why did his actions specifically cause the sea to split? The answer is that Yosef was a special individual. You see, Yosef was, an, was a tzaddik. What does it mean to be a tzaddik? 
What does it mean to be a righteous individual? Yosef had lived under the most trying of circumstances. As you know, he was thrown out by his, by his brothers. He was sold. He was a slave. He was accused of all kinds of things. His master's wife tried to seduce him. He withstood that test, withstood that challenge. He later had come down to Egypt, had become, he had, had saved the country, had become the viceroy second in command. He was living, so to speak, an Egyptian way of life. A diplomat, a big macha. On the surface, Joseph clearly looked like everybody else. But truth be told, throughout that time, Joseph remained at Sadiq. And this is our discussion today. The sea, the sea had made an agreement, no question about it. Had made an agreement to split for the Jewish people. But when that original deal was made, it had been shown up in heaven, perfect individuals. So when the sea said, ah, oh, for these individuals, so perfect individuals, of course I will split to make sure they can safely leave Egypt. For that, the sea was readily agreed to split. But when push came to shove, when the time came years later to split, those individuals were far from lofty. Look at our PowerPoint. They argued just before they cr crossed over the Red Sea. There were all kinds of complaints. They were far from holy rollers. Are there no graves in Egypt? Are, there, are you taking us to die in the desert? We would rather serve the Egyptians. All kinds of arguments. In fact, the Rambam Maimonides describes the Jews at that time as lowly idolatrous. The only reason why they merited to leave Egypt was out of God's extreme kindness, His promise to Abraham. So in fact, at the sea, with all the arguments of going back, well, it, it prompted the Satan to actually challenge God and say, why are you doing all these miracles for those people leaving Egypt? They're no different than the Egyptians themselves. They follow idolatry and they also follow idolatry. And therefore, there was a question in the sea's mind, in the soul of the sea. All kinds of bickering going on. Why should I split for these people? Sure, I made a, a, a promise years ago, but that was to an amazing different kind of personality. Then suddenly, suddenly, something happened. The sea saw Moses with the casket of Joseph. Suddenly, the image of Yosef came up. What was Joseph? As opposed to his brothers who were shepherds, he was fully engaged in this material world and yet successfully mastered it without harming his spiritual welfare. And this is the reason why when the brothers came down to Egypt, they couldn't recognize him. They couldn't fathom the idea that a man who appeared to be at the Egyptian an Egyptian viceroy could possibly be continued to be a devout Jew and cling to God. Here, Yosef presented the concept of a dual personality. He was fully involved in the world, and yet he remained cleaving to God. This came into full play in the story of Potiphar's wife. She tried to seduce him. Ultimately, he demonstrated that his spiritual side had triumphed. So when the sea saw Yosef's casket, it understood, understood something very deep. Something deep not only about the Jew who was crossing the Red Sea then, but about every one of us. It understood that though the souls that it had encountered in heaven many years ago were far greater than the, the ones it saw at the sea, Yosef's life proved that you must not limit one's vision to an external appearance. Because when you look at something or someone, you may be looking at it in a very flawed and distorted way. And this is what we're learning today. 
applying it to the marriage. They didn't recognize him. He looked like a handsome Egyptian. But inside, Joseph remained a tzaddik, a righteous individual. Right? Potiphar's desired Yosef. He looked handsome. He was ambitious. But he remained. He remained strong. He remained a tzaddik. He remained a righteous individual. The sea saw and fled. The sea saw something special. Just like Yosef. Looked one way, but deep down was good. It didn't change him. So too. The sea said, I will not treat the Jew the way he looks or she looks at this moment. I'm going to look back into their source. All the way back in heaven. Or, in fact, inside, there's that holy soul, the neshama that we all have. So in the context of marriage, In the context of marriage, remember, marriages are made in heaven. What does that mean? God decides who marries whom. Our souls have been united and ignited with a passionate bond that began in heaven. But sometimes, in real life, it doesn't look that way. How are we supposed to proceed? And many times, as our PowerPoint would indicate, the earthly view of husband and wife is self-centered. And each one says, for this? But then we are asked to step back. Just as when the Jewish people crossed over the Red Sea, things didn't look so hot. And for that reason, the Red Sea hesitated on splitting because it wasn't what, what it bargained for. It made a promise with something very holy, very good. It didn't look that way. But then learnt that really we're all like a Joseph. The core remains good. Don't treat someone on the surface. Think deeper. Think more holy. And you will find that with, within each and every one of us lies that holy soul. And in the, in the reference to marriage, the same is true in the context of a, in the life of marriage. You know, in the beginning, stars and the and eyes, you know, Excited. But then life continues with all kinds of challenges. So what are we supposed to do when those challenges come around? Jump out and say, forget about this. Not, it's not a marriage made in heaven. Hello. The marriage was made in heaven. And with the proper approach, the proper recognition of the spirituality within marriage, one can actually recapture and put magic back into the marriage. Obviously, there are situations where it's beyond repair. But the typical day-to-day -day challenges that people face in life really can be you know, externally brought on and pressured. But deep down within the person lies that holiness, lies that goodness. And therefore, the Torah this week is teaching us, remember, every marriage has a first marriage. Yes, we physically found each other. We went through the matchmaking process, found someone that we like and we look up to and we respect. Remember, there is the first side of it. There's the spiritual side. It's a spouse. It's two halves of the same soul. And we keep that in, in mind constantly and create the atmosphere in a home where that spirituality is always at the forefront, which comes through many of the observances of Torah, through the laws coming together, having family at, together, having Shabbos dinners together, making sure that we eat kosher. Many aspects of what the spiritual side of marriage is all about create such an atmosphere where that magic made in heaven continues to inspire and bring life into our marriages. May Hashem bless us to be filled with shalom bayis, with, with, with ultimate peace. May we all merit the ultimate peace for the entire world with the coming of Mashiach. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you all the best.